This is the politics of the historian turned soldier, Yang Wenli. He is one of the most brilliantly written and politically conscious characters in fiction. Also, if you don't want to be spoiled, watch the 110 OVA episode series before watching this video. Yang Wenli believed in democracy almost unquestionably. However, despite this, he was constantly conflicted in questioning the contradictions. This led to him sometimes having doubts about that system of government. The nation he was defending was littered with corruption. What he wanted was to find a better way, and this was difficult for him because, historically, democracy eventually disguises itself as fascism, legalized fascism. As a strong critique of his own government, he was brutally honest of the Free Planets Alliance contradictions publicly because he loved the democratic potential and the happy lifestyles that this can produce for the people if they can overcome corrupt governing. The Free Planets Alliance was aware of the types of controversial statements he could make and often silenced him. Yang additionally claimed he felt rewarded in the alliance. But it is clear he was getting harassed and surveilled relentlessly, arrested, and ultimately nearly assassinated by them. Thus, he called these contradictions out. He said the nation that neglects social inequality mischievously increases military budgets and then uses its power internally to suppress the citizens on the pretext of invasion by an external enemy is on the road to extinction. Such is the present state of the Free Planets Alliance. And to those in power, there is nothing cheaper than other people's lives. Those tiny lives have fought for over 150 years and paid for it. But that won't hurt their pockets because it's the common citizen who bears the expense. Additionally, Yang would sternly point out the parasitic and cowardice of his own government. When his own government held him illegally in an inquiry, he was told, Admiral, you're an excellent man, but you're still young. It seems you don't really understand the true nature of war, all right? Peace and freedom, lacking a sense of tension, cause people, people to de degenerate. It's war that gives people a sense of vitality. War is what makes civilizations advance and psychologically elevates people. Prolonged periods of peace and freedom will only decrease vitality in an already decadent age. Doesn't your precious history prove that? Yang countered with, What a wonderful observation. If only there was no one who had lost their life or family to war, then maybe I'd come to believe it. For people who prefer to take advantage of war and try to establish their own profit on other people's sacrifices, it's an unusually fascinating idea. And for people who show false patriotism and deceive other people, eh? If the defense of our homeland and self-sacrifice are as necessary as you say, before you tell other people to do this and do that, how about if you actually do it yourselves? What is the most cowardly and shameful thing in human conduct? It's when people with power and people who flatter them hide in safe places to extol war, force patriotism, and self-sacrifice on others, then send them to the battlefield to die for the sake of peace in the universe. Before we continue this fruitless war with the Empire, mustn't we first start by exterminating such evil parasites? Could you have heard it any other way? Though this is a, this is a powerful position to take and confront the crooked leadership of the Free Planets Alliance with, Yang only did it because he was forced to. This led to a conversation he had with Shonkov, where Yang said active duty soldiers can't voice political criticism at a public meeting, and you're free to think, but never free to speak. Shonkov pointed out Yang's inconsistency to silence himself in that sense, but Yang just ignored him as he does when pushed into a corner when his own political contradictions would get pointed out. There were times he would get upset at something someone told him, and he just look away in frustration. His docile role in this is interesting, considering he said, the freedom to not get involved is perhaps the most valuable freedom we have in this country. But what is polit political corruption? Yang explained it this way, political corruption isn't just politicians taking bribes, that is just the corruption of individual politicians. Political corruption means that people aren't free to criticize politicians for taking bribes. On leadership promoting Yang says, when people are promoted half-heartedly, I think they rapidly become corrupt. Despite the terrible conditions of the Free Planets Alliance, Yang Wenli said, I believe that being ruled by the worst democracy is preferable to being ruled by the best autocracy. That's why I'm fighting Prince Reinhard von Lohengram on behalf of Job Trunik. I think it's a good principle. On the other hand, he has said of, Tr of Trunik, What good is democracy if it gives power to a man like that? 
Not to mention, he also said he wouldn't want to become Trunic's plaything despite doing just that. Yang Wenli also stated, um, I'm a man of the alliance. I must follow the foolish orders of my government. There are many contradictions here. He sees this while at the same time, the autocracy of the empire is coming out of their own corruption with Reinhardt and doing much better than the so-called democracy of his. Yang understands this strange situation. Ultimately, he preferred both the alliance and empire to coexist. He elaborated on this by explaining, what, what, must we, what we must do is coexist with the Lohengram administration. The Golden Bomb administration was an example of democratically constructed political system which brought about the most anti-democratic administration. But the Lohengram administration is, a, is an example of a non-democratically constructed political system which is bringing out an exceptionally democratic administration. It isn't government by the people, but at present it's government for the people. Once we've acknowledged that coexistence with Lohengram isn't just possible, it becomes necessary. In another scene, Yang says, For the time being, I'm hoping for the war to end. Humanity doesn't necessarily need to be united as one nation. I wouldn't mind it a bit if the Alliance and the Empire coexisted peacefully. The gist of democracy lies in the coexistence of diverse political values. On a related note, why did Yang Wenli favor democracy so much? He said, because the gift of democracy lies in control by the people who have the power. Democracy institutionalizes the control of the power holders by law and structure, and the military needs this control the most. They fight for the political structure that fundamentally denies them. The military of a democracy must accept that contradictory structure. The only things the military can demand from its government are a retirement pension and pay leave. That's about it. In other words, the rights of the workers, they cannot demand more than that. Reinhardt would eventually question Yang that this was the same democratic process that put people like Trunik in power and who produced those like Rudolf who would go on to create the empire. But Yang responded with his belief that the right to violate the rights of the people belongs to the people. In other words, when the people gave power to Rudolf von, Go von Goldenbaum or to an incomparably smaller man like Job Trunik, the responsibility belongs to the people. It belongs to no one else. That's the important point. The sin of a dictatorship is that the people can push off the failures of government onto one man. Compared, that, uh, compared to that cardinal sin, the accomplishments of a hundred wise rulers seems small. Yang also questioned Reinhardt's glorious empire by saying that a dictatorship itself isn't absolutely evil, it's just another form of government. The point is how you run it for the benefit of society. Prince Lohengram will lead an efficient, impartial, and good government. The empire has actually reformed in that direction. In reality, it's dictatorship rather than democracy that drastically advances government reforms. But I think humanity ought to avoid being united by a dictatorship. While it's true the Prince Lohengram might have that talent, what about his descendants, his heir? Rulers aren't necessarily wise through generations. He's like a miracle which could happen only once every few centuries. I don't think that the entire human race should be ruled by a system where everything depends on one person's character. Considering the 150 year long ongoing war at the time, what was Yang trying to put, achieve politically? He states, there, was, there has never been permanent peace in human history, but there have been plenty of ages with decades of peace. In short, my hope is, hardly enough, for a few decades of peace in the future. This is what he meant when he told a stranger in a child who wants to be a soldier, Miss Maya, when that child grows up, I think a peaceful age will arrive. There will probably be no need to force him to be a soldier. Personally, this is his way of trying to save Yulian as well. As well. And, this was, and this was what he said that convinced Shonkov that Yang Wenli is the real deal. When it came to assuming power, Yang had the potential to make a good candidate, considering how politically conscious he was. However, he said, to me, political power is like sewage. You can't do without it, but it's not something you want to approach. I'm not a, I'm not a soldier by nature. The leader, the leader must be a civilian. There's no such thing as a democratic republic ruled by a military commander. I should never be leader. Later on, Yang would say, I don't want any power. If I did, I would have had any number of opportunities during last year's coup d'etat. After being told people change and that he might have a change in character, how Rudolf did when he was in power, Yang said, do you think if I had such power, I'd change too? Yang seemed open to talk about it more as the OVA series progressed, but remained conflicted until the end. 
One of the most important influences that, that helped shape Yang Wenli's mind was his study of history. Though he claimed he only studied it a little, he said, The pen is mightier than the sword. In human affairs, the truth is hard to find, which, which is why that expression is true. We couldn't topple Rudolf the Great with the sword, but we expose his crimes against human society. That is the power of the pen. The pen can impeach the dictator of a hundred years ago or the tyrant of a thousand years ago. For as long as human history goes on, the past will continue to accumulate. History isn't just records of the past. It's also proof that civilization has continued to advance to the present. Our present civilization is a result of our past, understand? In the long flow of time, living things know nothing of their ancestors, except for the, the genes they've inherited. Only mankind has history. Having a history differentiates mankind from all other living species. That's why I wanted to be a historian. The only reason I'm in this sad state is that I made the wrong first move. He added in a different episode, I only studied a little history. I've learned that there are two currents of thought in human society. The opinion that there are things worth more than human life, and the opinion that there is nothing preferable in life. When people begin to fight, it is on the pretext of the former type of people, and it justifies the latter when they stop. For how many hundreds, how many thousands of years has that been continuing? No, generally speaking, the human race doesn't matter. Generally speaking, can I do something just to be worth the quantity of spilled blood? On a similar note, he goes on to say about Rudolf. It kept coming back to me. Rudolf, who founded the Galactic Empire, and that bunch who founded the, the National Salvation Military Council, were both convinced that only they could save the day and they continue to think so. It's strangely paradoxical, but what made Rudolf create an atrocious, despotic government was his sense of duty to the whole human race. When it comes to Yang's tactics in battle, he knew very well that history repeats itself. As a result, he used that as a weapon in battle. This allowed him to predict what his enemy was going to do or plan ahead. A just man, Young understood that in this 150 year old battle, attacking civilians is never acceptable. He told Yulian, please don't fight without thinking about the enemy's civilians. This also coincided with, with when Yang said, my principle has always been to try and win without fighting. I'm not going to abandon that principle now. An example of Yang doing this, he tries to win bloodless wars where he will attempt to give the enemy a psychological shock that will discourage them from fighting and cause them to surrender. This will be shown in, in the series when Yang destroyed the Artemis necklace weapons, which the enemy hailed as its last hope. Something Yang has often said is that nothing lasts forever and that this applies to nations. Yang explained, Yulian, people tend to make the common mistake of believing that a situation will last forever. Try and think about it. The Galactic Empire didn't exist 500 years ago. The history of the Free Planets Alliance is half that length and Fezan has reached an age of no more than a century. Anything that hasn't existed since the genesis of the universe didn't survive until the end. Change is sure to come. That change is the person of Prince Reinhard von Lohengram has first swept the Galactic Empire and is now extending feelers. Trying to entangle all of human society in them. Yang later added, Look, Yulian, just as people sometimes die, nations aren't eternally indestructible things either. The entities called nations are, more, are no more than simple tools. If you remember that fact, Maybe you can maintain your perspective. Even after considering all this, Yang said time and time again he did not want to be a soldier. About wars, he commented, There are a few wars between good and evil. Most are between one good and another good. Also, the reasons for 90% of all wars are cheatingly moronic in hindsight. In the remaining 10%, the reasons are even more so and clearly evident to those involved. However, Shonkov told him, There is nobody who hates the, the, the stupidity of war as much as you. At the same time, there is no more skillful in this war than you. Yang admitted he has no talent for organization, is forgetful, and also poor at operating equipment. But what Shonkov says is true. He also asked Yang if he could defeat Reinhardt in an even match if Yang controlled all the troops. Yang replied, The importance of strategy is to set up an equal condition. It's silly to ignore that strategic situation and discuss just the re relative merits of tactics. What Yang meant is that when he would direct the fleet, their victory didn't rely entirely upon him. It is determined upon how well all the higher ranking officials coordinated and worked together with the rest of the soldiers. 
because Yang cannot do anything by himself. If Yang were to start losing valuable admirals that help operate other parts of, the, of his fleet, it's as if he lost a leg. This is why Fisher's death was so crushing to him at, in the end. It's amusing to see when Shonkov would poke at Yang's political contradictions. He said of Yang, He's a person who's comparably transparent. He's got a good, a good head, but his character is simple, right? Because on an individual level, he's somewhat naive. And this is the state of be in this, and it was this state of being naive that brought upon his downfall. I've mentioned a few points from the famous inquiry already. There was a point Yang was called a radical anarchist by the Free Planets Alliance leadership. That part is as follows. Man number one. We'll leave this general subject. We'll turn to the next topic. Before you fought the Coupe de Tarts 11th fleet, you spoke to the troops of the whole fleet. You said that the fate of nations and so forth was of no account when compared to individual rights and freedoms. There's been testimony by many people who heard you say that. This is true, right? Yang. I couldn't say it was like that word for word, but I certainly said something resembling that. Man, number one. Don't you think it was a disgraceful utterance? Yang. Huh? What is? Man number one. You are a soldier who's been given the duty of protecting our nation, and you say it, it isn't a disgrace to your position to make speeches belittling the nation. Yang says, That's what you say, Chairman. I think it was an unusually profound utterance for me because a nation doesn't create individuals by cellular division. Instead, it is individuals with autonomous intent who, who gather to establish a nation. In a democratic society, it is axiomatic as to which one is the master and which one is the servant. The man says, Axiomatic, eh? My understanding is rather different. Humans are social creatures. Nobody can live alone. Thus, the nation holds indispensable value to people. Yang. Really? People, people may need societies, but they don't necessarily need nations. Man number one. Well, I'm surprised. You're, pretty, you're a pretty radical anarchist. Yang. No, but you could say I'm a veganist. Although, as soon as I look at my delicious meat dish, or a delicious meat, meat dish, I break my commandments at once. Man. Admiral Yang, do you mean to make a mockery of this inquiry? And Yang says, far from it. I don't have that intention in the least. On the topic of violence, Yang understood the difference between different types, as he said. An army is a tool for violence, and there are two kinds of violence. Violence to control and oppress, and violence as a means of liberation. You know what we call a national army is fundamentally the former example. It's a pity, but history doesn't lie. When those in power confront popular opposition, there aren't many examples of the army siding with the people, far from it. In the past, in country after country, the army itself evolved into a power structure and came to control the people with violence. Going onwards towards the end of his life, his consciousness seemed even more conflicted and nervous. He had that all too familiar hope in the democratic process, to the point he never expected they would try to kill him without trial. When that happened, and he was almost assassinated, it bothered him very much to the point he felt ashamed. This ties into how politically naive he was, which results in his tragic death later. Yang went from smug and confident to frustrated that he was arrested on the basis of unverifiable rumors. He began to realize how desperate his situation was and went back on, and went back on some of his principles. One example was when he took advantage of an empire hired up's death. He told himself he'd go to hell just for this. He had been called Miracle Yang all this time, but it finally revealed near his end that he never cared for that. But Yang continued to contradict himself with his utopian ideals. He said, well, it's no use blaming someone who is trying to do their job, even in the Alliance Forces Command. From, uh, even in the Alliance, Forces Command from above are absolute, even if they're unreasonable. Everybody has to display a certain loyalty towards their paycheck. I was the same way. It isn't just a piece of paper. It's a chain that binds people. It never really came, became clear to him how false his, his democracy was. His democracy was hypocr hypocrisy. Maybe if he lived longer, he would see that no matter what he tried, nothing really seemed to work. Maybe, he'd come to, maybe he would come to say, I was wrong. Democracy is not the way of doing things. We, we will build a new system of governance, if only. As the day of his assassination came near, Yang continued to show disappointment in himself and with the democracy of the Free Planets Alliance. He said, It's not like I rid myself of all personal feelings. At the Battle of Vermilion, if not for the government's order, I could have defeated Reinhard von Lohengram. But Yulian, 
I didn't want to kill him. I'm saying that honestly. He's not necessarily perfect in, the, in his character, but he's the most brilliant existence of the past few centuries of history. To destroy that with my own hand. I couldn't help but feel scared by it. At that time, I may have avoided responsibility with the governmental order as an excuse. And for that, I may have been loyal both to the government and to myself. But, for instance, for the soldiers who died in the war, that could be characterized as an act of unforgivable betrayal. After all, they didn't fight for the preservation of the power holders or for my sentimentality. Oh, I'm always like this. I'm just constantly without progress. But his loyalty remained to democracy, as troubled as he was with it. No matter what, he had to work something out with a, with a democratic mindset and outcome. Though in the novels, he thought about joining Reinhardt, it became clear right before his death there was no way. In one of Yang's last statements, he said, No matter how brilliant a ruler Kaiser Reinhardt himself is, I cannot take the hand of an autocratic ruler. As much as the Kaiser has his own nature, I also have things that I can't break free of. If I lose this battle to the Kaiser, most likely the Kaiser would treat my followers with kindness. With the future of each of those individuals, that may be more fortunate of an outcome. At, le at least so far, there's no doubt that Kaiser Reinhardt is one of the highest grade autocratic rulers in human history. So we're forced to face the ultimate contradiction. In other words, when the absolute majority of the people affirm and accept autocracy, we who advocate for the sovereignty of the people become the enemy of the people. If we have to bring down a virtuous ruler to preserve the institution of democracy, democracy becomes the enemy of good governance. We have no choice but to laugh at such a paradox. There have been all kinds of people in the past who justify bloodshed in the present by citing potential danger in the future. For political persecution, that logic is usually used as a rationale. I want to secure a seabed of democracy where we can lie low while things are governed wisely and break out when misgovernment mis occurs. In order to have the empire approve of it, we must fight against Kaiser Reinhardt and win. Shortly before the assass his assassination, Yang Wenyi lost Fisher, which devastated his battle potential. His team didn't seem to realize this, but he made it clear when he said, We've lost Vice Admiral Fisher. Coming up with tactics alone won't win us any battles. If the fleet doesn't have the ability to execute the plan flawlessly, there's nothing we can do. If we refuse to offer to take the offer of talks now, it would be an act of suicide. As Yang lay bloody and near death, I could hear an old saying of him ring out loud. In the end, conspiracies of terrorism cannot reverse the flow of history, but they can make it stagnant. A star had fallen, and the large book of the legend of Yang Wenli concludes as the final page turns and the book closes. It will come to be a relic amongst the other literature of the great ancient heroes of mankind, for Yang was the embodiment of the people of the Free Panas Alliance, of their ambitions and desires for a true democracy. He was the anger of the people, the one who knew how to speak the troubles of the downtrodden effectively and sharply to inspire. His words resonated with those who wanted a better way out of corruption. Now when the people think of Yang Wenli, they smile. Yang was a humble man who cared for everyone, especially the little people. He had no desire for fame and fortune and was content with having a simple life, reading books for the rest of his life. But his mission was sadly one that required a lifetime dedication. His mission was one that required to be fully aware of the wickedness of the enemy and that they would do whatever it takes, no matter how cruel, to liquidate you and that it's fatal to be politically naive. I came to know Yang Wenli and it changed my life. A character who was merely words and colors brought to life better and more respectable than the miserable politicians of our own lives. Thank you for listening.